next uh, speaker this morning who will offer one more perspective on the future of peer review is Pascal Pitzler. Pascal is an assistant professor in computer science at the Noises Center for Knowledge and Able Computing at uh, the Ohio Center of Excellence at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. From 2004 to 2009, he was assistant professor at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. And from 2001 to 2004, he was postdoctoral researcher at TU Dresden, both in Germany. He acquired his PhD in 2001 from University College Cork in Ireland in mathematics. He researches and publishes in diverse areas within computer science. His current research focus is on semantic web. He is editor-in-chief of the iOS Press Journal, Semantic Web, Interoperability, Usability, and Applicability, and of the iOS uh, book series, Studies on the Semantic Web. He has co-authored two very prominent introductory textbooks on Semantic Web, one of which was listed in Outstanding Academic Titles 2010 and Information in Computer Science by Chelsea Magazine. Thank you, Jim. The Noasis Center at Wright State University is one of the primary locations of semantic web research in the US. So this is where I am, and I'm primarily a researcher. And uh, in contrast to the previous speakers, I have not researched the topic of peer review in depth. Um, the situation um, which, which brought me here is, is simply that we were approached, we meaning me and Christoph Janowicz, my co-editor-in-chief, we were approached by iOS Press about setting up this journal, and so we sat together and, and well, how do we set this up? And in particular, my, my co-editor-in-chief uh, is a proponent for open and transparent review processes. And since I have been trying with similar ideas in the past, I was a very happy re recipient of these ideas. So it was more about fleshing out the details than about discussing that. And um, we're, I'm not going to talk about a vision. I'm talking about something we're actually doing. So we have to find a middle ground, because I believe if we would go without anything in between towards the, the big visions, the big changes which um, Nick and, uh, and Jeremy have, uh, have proposed that it's probably not going to work. So we need to find a middle ground. However, let me also add here that I found the two talks already very stimulating. And um, uh, there are a lot of ideas there where I can fully identify with. But we had to, to get something done, something processable, something um, which we could start. So. I'm going to tell you about the journal first, a little bit, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about our review process, which we have implemented, and a little bit about the rationales, and then about some lessons learned from the whole process. The journal is an international journal, it's subscription-based, open access available as an option, author pays both online and print. The open access option is actually important for us because we have a lot of applications in life science domain in the semantic web area, and in particular in some areas of life science, open access seems to be uh, very important. Not so much for core computer science topics, usually. The journal is actually just a year old, so we're very new. We just started out. Other major journals in the field are roughly from 2005. So we've been entering a space with the journal which was already occupied by, by big players in the field. Um, however, the semantic web research community is growing rapidly and it's spreading out. And there's a lot of <coughs> industry take up of the ideas and of the methods. So there was space for more diversity and this is exactly what we wanted to do. We wanted to add more diversity, more options, uh, more discussions, more possibilities. The journal as I said, a year old, we have about 90 submissions to date. This is not counting the invited papers by editorial board members for the first issue. I actually, the first issue should be circulating somewhere in the room. About 50 revisions uh, from these papers, and currently we have 10 accepted papers, which shows that we are going for a high quality journal. And we need to establish that early on, so this is the policy we're following right now. The average review turnaround time is 65 days, which in our opinion is still too long, but I think it's, it's okay um, at this stage. Whether that's a good measure, I don't know, but our main website counts about 50,000 hits to date, which is about 1,000 a week. 
top review paper hits, the, the review papers are available online and we can see how many hits these pages get. There's nine with over a thousand hits, most of them have 500 or more. Uh, we have about 200 Twitter followers, which is not a lot, but um, this needs to be taken into the perspective that our Twitter feed is extremely boring because it's just an automatic message which our journal website creates and feeds onto Twitter whenever we change something on the website. Right? But still 200 people are following that, so uh, happy about that. The second issue will be forthcoming shortly. Connects papers by some very prominent contributors in the field. We currently have text special issue calls posted, so I, I would think we're running well. We have a backlog of papers which are going through revision processes. Um, so this is uh, probably going as well as I hoped it would. So about the review process. The core idea which you wanted to set up was open and transparent reviewing. And uh, I'll first give you the key ideas which we were implementing, and then I'll tell you about the process, how we do that in practice. The submitted manuscripts are made public at submission time, and the authors are known in that case. Now you could say, if you're just referring to previous speakers, that is a kind of uh, post-publication review process we do because the papers are immediately put online. I'm not thinking of it that way because there is also a proper publication in the journal. So we publish it only online for the reviewing process. Still, there is already visibility gained there by the authors. The review texts, um, sorry, the, uh, we solicit reviewers as usual. And the review texts are made public. And the reviewer names are also made public although we actually have an opt-out by the reviewers. So reviewers can opt out of making their names public if they think they need some kind of protection. We felt that this is necessary not only because reviewer protection is probably, uh, well at least for me, the only convincing argument for anonymous reviews, but also because otherwise uh, adoption by the community would probably have been much more difficult. The texts are made public anyway, so only the reviewer names might uh, be erased from the public display. There is also an option on the Semantic Web Journal website to add open reviews so everybody can add reviews. These must be signed so the names of the reviewers known. And comments can also be added by anybody. Currently, we editors-in-chief are monitoring that process. So we're looking at comments before we actually put them through on the public website. Um, we felt that kind of check is necessary, although actually um, we didn't have any case to complain yet about that. So everything which happened there was extremely constructive. We currently hide reviews from the web after a couple of weeks. We do this manually. This is um, because it might be embarrassing for authors to have lists of typos they had in the initial submission posted on the web after 10 years. And uh, rejected papers are also hidden after some time. The titles are the only thing which are currently displayed for a longer time. This is also to basically avoid embarrassment even for the author. So sometimes you just submit a bad paper. Uh, and afterwards you realize it was probably just not a good idea because you did some wrong thinking. So it's better not to have this on record forever. The review process which we follow um, actually uses two systems. One is the traditional review management system, which is non-public. This is provided by the publisher, iOS Press. And the other system is our public journal website. And the reason why we're doing it that way is simply because it, it seemed to be the most convenient way to set this all up. We are computer scientists, in particular my, my co-editor chief, Christoph Janowicz, he does a lot of hacking on the semantic web journal website, uh, which helps. Uh, otherwise, it would probably be impossible to run this process. Um, having the review management system, the classical one in the background, also helps us just in avoiding the cost of additional implementation of the workflow on our website. The submitted manuscripts come in via the non-public review management system, and they're then copied onto the public website and made available there. The editors-in-chief assign editors, editor solicits reviewers, as in the classical peer review process. And inside the review management systems, the names of the reviewers for the solicited reviews are known, also as usual. We copy 
these reviews onto the public websites, and here reviewers can opt for anonymity if they want to. Plus, there might be open reviews and comments on the public website, which are signed by name, and editors in chief screen that to just avoid that um, things get up there which are not up to scientific standards. As I said, we, we didn't really have to do much screening so far. Both open and solicited reviews are being taken into consideration in the decision which is made jointly by the editors and the editors in chief, and the decision is posted on the public website. And then if it's a revision, then we just repeat the process. So this is what we are essentially doing right now. And you probably noticed that some of the ideas which previous speakers have been mentioning um, in a very, say, preliminary or simplistic form show up here. Some ideas show up here. Um, and uh, that was exactly the idea, trying to find a middle ground between the vision of a completely transparent review process and something which is manageable at this stage in the development. The whole process, we want the whole process to take six to eight weeks, currently 65 days average turnaround, so we still have things to improve here. Uh, I think we're still much better than some other journals in the area. Now what's the rationale behind that? What was our rationale behind that? And, uh, Tim yesterday asked whether it has anything to do with our, our field because it's kind of quickly, you want to get papers out quickly, etc. That, that actually wasn't the case. These are side effects which are very nice. Uh, we haven't even been thinking about that initially. My personal motivation for going for an open and transparent review process was simply that I was disappointed about too many low quality anonymous reviews which I got. And furthermore, I got those in a scientific environment in which it is often deemed inappropriate to complain to the editor or the PC chair about such reviews. So that, that basically triggered it for me. Um, I have the time to just tell you a little story. I got a, a decision letter, well, if you call it a decision letter, from an editor-in-chief just at the beginning of this week, I think on Saturday. Uh, it was a paper which we had submitted was actually already the revision of a paper which we uh, had submitted. So they had reviewed the previous uh, version and told us, well, we encourage you to, to resubmit. So we resubmitted. Uh, we resubmitted nine months ago. The journal is a very good journal, which I don't want to name, and the, the journal has uh, not a big, but some track record in publishing papers on similar topics. So we sub resubmitted nine months ago, and um, last Week, end of last week, I got a letter from the editor saying, um, sorry, we couldn't find reviewers for your paper, so we can't publish it. Right? I mean, that sucks. <laughs> uh, after nine months. Okay? So, um, anyway, so these are the reasons why, why we, we, we thought we want to do something here. Open and transfer and reviewing. Why? Um, my first answer is usually, why not? And uh, there's a lot of general rationales, which in particular Nick has been mentioning, and, and also Jeremy, so I don't have to go through all these details. The, the, the why not, um, well, the why not is a bit provocative, right? Because it says, okay, well, why should we continue the old system? Just give me good rationales, give me good arguments. I'm still missing good, good arguments. Uh, we have the, the traditional system, which is asymmetric. Um, the the uh, traditional system, which, which hides the decision process where you just don't know what's happening. You don't have accountability. Uh, you don't have a way to, to judge the decision process. Um, you have only very fuzzy ways to appeal. So that's an asymmetric process. On the other hand, we're scientists, right? I mean, scientists live from scientific discussion, live from public scientific discussion. So why would you stick with an asymmetric process which is where accountability is lost if you can also put up a, a transparent, symmetric process where we indulge in what we scientists should actually do in the scientific discourse. So what are the reasons for that? Probably the only reason which I think uh, is a valid argument for anonymous reviewing is reviewer protection. That's probably the only thing I can think of. All others are arguments where I need to see validation. Okay? Uh, and in particular for this aspect, reviewer protection, that's why we have the opt-out. So people can opt out. So I believe, yes, this is something which still needs to be in the system somewhere, simply because, say, as a young, as a young uh, uh, researcher, if you get a paper from a big shot, you might be careful. Okay. So 
<clears throat> what we gain is we gain accountability through transparency uh, because we publish the reviewers' names and the editors' names. Um, we have a transparent process. The editors and reviewers are actually also managed, uh, 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 named on the published papers. The objectivity of our decision process can be judged by everyone because the information is online. Some authors actually do something which we don't ask them to do, namely they also publish their replies to the reviews when they resubmit on the website as a comment to the reviews. So that's fine, we don't ask for that. Yeah? But this is, this is the scientific discourse uh, which you can stimulate that way. Reviewers and editors get some visibility and acknowledgement. Uh, like for example, a, a young but good PhD student could start contributing open reviews and because it's just very good reviewing, it could be promoted to a solicited reviewer and just gain some visibility through that. That actually happens. Uh, we effectively avoid conflicts of interest primarily because it's visible. Okay? If the reviewer is a friend of the author, then that's known in the community. So we can detect that. There are some studies uh, I've seen which show that review quality is not affected by either procedure. Uh, I put a question mark here because I think this is a preliminary result, but it's encouraging. Um, this is one of the arguments I'm sometimes getting from, from peers who say, well, is this a good idea to have this open transparent review process? Uh, people would be more difficult in being critical in the reviews. That's not our observation. Uh, probably a little bit, but, but, but not so much. And there are these studies, and uh, I was actually surprised because my, my hypothesis would have been that the review quality goes up, and that is still my hypothesis. So this was only one study here. I would think that reviewers would should tend to be more careful and constructive and less likely to show strong bias. Would you write a, a four-line review if it's posted on the website with your name? Okay, I probably wouldn't. What else do we gain? We stop the reviewer guessing game. In particular, um, in a, a probably small research communities or if it's core papers um, in, a, in an area, then if you get a review which is right to the point and discusses technical details of your paper, then you can very well guess who's the reviewer, which adds to the asymmetry of the situation and makes the situation just more awkward. Um, we can even get authors and reviewers into a dialogue if this seems helpful. That happened in, in at least one case for the journal. So since they know their names, they can even just email each other and talk about it. They might know each other anyway, because they're both researchers in the same area. Good papers get immediate visibility. Most uh, paper pages on our journal website have more than 500 reviews to date. So this is also an added incentive. Lessons learned. We were a bit worried in the beginning when we set up the process of having a chaotic system with author bashing and reviewer bashing and harsh comments, etc. It hasn't happened. The reviewing has been very smooth and very constructive so far. And feel free to go to the website and just verify that for yourself. Look at the, at the reviews. Some are actually quite impressive also in length and quality. Most reviews are actually very substantial and also very constructive, and we did not have any major controversies between reviewers and authors. Uh, what is also nice to see is that we've observed major improvements through revisions um, in, the, in the process. So this also works, which is probably an effect of the, the constructive process. I'm already running out of time. Okay. Another lesson learned is that the non-standard process is additional work, in particular for us editors and chiefs. We need to constantly monitor, monitor, monitor the process, and we constantly need to explain, explain, explain the process, simply because it's a non-standard process and people are not aware of that. And if they review for the journal and then they do the next review a few months later, they've basically forgotten about that. Uh, so we need to do that. We also need to manually management the process, which includes the two review management systems. We like to automate it that need some resources. So we need to do that. So we wouldn't be able to do that without, uh, well, a person who could do the hacking, which is my co-editor chief, and uh, without the dedication and intrinsic motivation we have as editors in chief. And like for all journals, uh, the benefits of being a, an editor in chief of a journal which is running well are simply not uh, outweighing the, the cost in terms of, of work you have to put into it. 
So you really need some, some intrinsic motivation to get this done. The opinions uh, differ a lot. So we noticed that we're getting strong opinions from both sides. Um, there's a very small fraction of reviewers who want to stay anonymous, I'd say about 5% of the reviews. Um, we had only one person so far which outright rejected reviewing for the journal because of our process. Because that, that person argued that the process is, is, is uh, not a good process for the community. I perfectly accept that, so no problems with that. Open reviewing is rare. I would say about 5% of the papers get open reviews. And um, on the other hand, some people participate in our journal mainly because of our process, because they like it. And you might have an advantage here because we are web researchers, semantic webbers who are web researchers. The web is an artistic, an anarchistic place where um, social networks play a role and interaction, everybody contributes. So we obviously have researchers interested in our research area who are also web people. So they just like the transparent, the open, the putting on the website, the discussion there, etc. A few colleagues reported to me being a bit scared about their paper being publicly dissected before being accepted for publication. I can understand that very well. Um, the only thing I can say here is it hasn't happened so far, and I don't think it will happen. So probably as our journal gains more speed, uh, people will see that this is not something they need to worry about. My personal feeling is that the reviews tend to be a little bit too positive in terms of the final verdict, not in terms of the review text. But when in doubt, they rather go for the more positive tick and say minor revision rather than major revision. Um, so it is even more important here that editors and editors in chief actually do not trust review scores blindly, but look at the text and make decisions based on that. So we, have, we get a lot of encouragement, um, as mentioned, people who like it, who contribute because of that. Um, we also receive critique. Uh, the main critique, again, is reviewer protection, and I understand that very well, and so we have the opt-out version. Um, but we are contributing to the diverse landscape of publishing in our field. Let me just add here that I'm not ideological with respect to this. I believe that anonymous reviewing has a space, and it is also necessary to have that, which is also why we have it in the journal. And in fact, if all journals had open and transparent reviewing, then probably somebody should start running a journal with anonymous reviewing. The diversity is what is good for us, for the community, because people have different preferences. So let's just play it out and see how it works. Thank you very much for your attention. Does the uh, taking down the uh, rejected papers and uh, taking down some of the reviewer comments after some period of time, does that actually accomplish the goal you wanted to accomplish? Because after all, if it's up for a period of time, I mean, it can be archived somewhere, and it may well be archived automatically by Google, if nothing else. Um, so is there any point to that? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I believe, well, I totally understand uh, the, the concern here. And I mean, um, since we're in the semantic web area, people know about the web for contributing to the journal. They're also well aware of that. So um, we don't need to point that out to the kind of people uh, we're working with here. Um, still, I mean, one thing is having things available somewhere uh, by searching for it. And the other thing is having them publicly displayed on our website. Okay? So from that perspective, it is a little bit of protection. But you're entirely right. We cannot erase things from the web. So perfectly right. Um, sometimes people will submit articles, and if they're rejected, they'll submit somewhere else. But if it's up on the web, then it's not the first time, and it's not fresh for a resubmission. How do you counter that? This is one of the reasons why we, we take them off. Okay, it's basically for, for protecting um, the authors in that respect. Uh, one effect I would hope to see over the medium term with our journal 
is that people get more selective in what they actually submit to our journal because they effectively have that drawback. If they submit a paper uh, which is not likely to be accepted, at least after some revisions, then they have to live with that. And they have to live with the fact that uh, it, is, it has been established publicly known that they've already done that in the past. So in a sense, it's a, post, uh, a pre submission quality check by the authors, which needs to be applied. I don't think that's a bad thing, okay? But it might result in us getting fewer publications. Um, if we instead get higher quality publications, and I can live with that, and so far we don't have a lack, a lack of, uh, of submissions. So we were aware of that problem. Uh, we were watching it from the beginning, but so far it hasn't happened. It didn't have a negative effect on us. But we'll keep watching that. Okay, thank you.